Hello, everyone, and welcome to Chapter 16. So what we talked about in Chapter 14 was the nervous system, and we talked a little bit about some hormones and, or neurotransmitters of the nervous system, and we said that the basic job of the nervous system is to act as a communication when sensory information is received, and then the correct motor outputs to um, what we call the effectors, which could be muscle, glands, other nerve cells, or other tissues. So what you're going to find in the endocrine system is that, like the nervous system, it also is meant to send messages throughout the body, except the little packages of messengers that will go around the body are not called neurotransmitters like in the nervous system, but they're going to be called hormones. So what we're going to do in this very long, very in-depth chapter is that we're going to accomplish two goals. One, we're going to talk about the functions of the endocrine system, and then two, we're going to talk about some prominent endocrine organs of your body and what their jobs are. So you'll find in your textbook that there will be some endocrine aspects that we don't go over in full detail or at all. Those are still equally important. It's just that in the interest of time, I'm going to really just hit those major endocrine organs. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So the endocrine system produces special types of chemical signals that we call hormones, as I said before. These hormones help with the, the long-term regulations of other organs. Because it's also meant to be a messaging system, it works very closely, the endocrine system does, with the nervous system to help keep your body in that normal level. So whether it's body temperature, blood glucose level, um, ion concentration, and all of those entities need to stay in a very narrow range in order to keep a nice, healthy working body. So for glands, and we talked about how the nervous system can send messages to glands to get them to do something, there are two different types of glands in the body, or two major camps, I should say. You have exocrine glands and you have endocrine glands. Exocrine gland, anytime you see EX in any type of scientific discipline, you should be thinking outward. So exocrine glands are going to release their secretions into ducts to go out on top of surfaces, whether on, onto the surface of the inside of your stomach or onto the surface of the inside of your intestines or even onto the surface of your skin. So they are exiting out into um, other places and they have ducts. Endocrine glands, on the other hand, they're going to secrete their products within the bloodstream. And the, because they're released within the bloodstream, they're going to deliver those products all throughout their body. So with endocrine glands, we're going to talk about target cells. Target cells are the only ones who can actually have the lock, if you will, to fit the key of that particular hormone. So we say that in fancy science way. Target cells have receptor proteins for a specific hormone, and that hormone receptor bind together like a lock and key. So how are the nervous system and the endocrine system alike? Well, as we've already established, they both use chemical messengers. There are neurotransmitters in the nervous system, like acetylcholine, and then we have hormones in the endocrine system, and we're going to talk about a whole host, host of hormones that act. Um, the endocrine system is a little bit slower than the nervous system, and the nervous system is going to be faster because of the way that the system, um, the signal travels through the nervous system. So when the hormones are used as a means of communication, it happens between cells, between body parts, and hormone interaction, and you've probably heard of that if you've met someone and you guys hit it off really easily, or if you've met someone and it doesn't quite work out and you get what are called bad vibes from them, or you get good vibes from somebody, we can even have hormonal signaling between individuals. So most of these hormones act at a distance where they are secreted. Hormones can affect metabolisms of cells that have receptors to bind to them, aka insulin and glucagon. Insulin when it binds to the surface of the cell and those specialized receptors, so they're the target cells, it allows for glucose to come inside and then that glucose can be used for energy. So it's used for that metabolism. So that's exactly what this bottom bullet says, that hormones, and it doesn't say the type of hormone, but I'm telling you such as insulin, can affect the metabolism of the cell. But you also have hormones like testosterone and estrogen that can also affect the metabolism of those target cells. So local hormones only are going to affect neighboring cells. So you can kind of think about that in the same way that you have a local neighborhood. So if there is a brewery that's local, then it usually harvests all of its grain or barley locally. Um, it brews it locally. So it does that in a very small radius area. So these local hormones um, only affect these neighboring cells, and they're not carried all throughout the body throughout the bloodstream. So 
stream. So examples of local hormones are prostaglandins and growth factors, and they're only going to do their job to those locally affected cells. Pheromones, on the other hand, they're going to influence behavior of other individuals. So that's this class of hormones that we said um, you get those good vibes slash bad, bad vibes from someone or you have that chemistry. You just don't have that chemistry with someone. Um, these are hormones that can influence behavior of other animals. So as animals, because humans are animals, um, we rely heavily on pheromones to mark territory and crack, attract a mate. So we don't really mark our territory with um, our pheromones in the same way that, oh, say, your dog or your cat or the fox outside marks its territory, because I highly doubt that you guys go around your house and you, you pee. <laughs> and leave those hormone hormone track around there. But what we do know is that unintentionally you mark your territory. So you'll probably notice that your car, your clothes, your house has a certain smell to it. Um, and I don't mean just like the air freshener smell that you that you can smell that you smell around because it, it it makes your house smell good but even your clothes have a certain smell to them and those are because of the pheromones that your body is releasing so you are marking your territory unbeknownst to you so you ever notice that you have like a significant other if they leave a sweatshirt or a t-shirt or something there you just like to be in it you just love the way it smells and to them they're like you're weird because it doesn't smell like anything it just smells like laundry detergent or whatever but you do release these pheromones um and you, in a sense, are marking your territory. So for the, as far as the attracting a mate thing, um, once again, you're not spraying an area with your body juices, but um, you'll probably notice that for your significant other, you are going to enjoy or be attracted to the smell of them even before they take um, – they put like lotions and perfumes and things on like that. So once they step out of the shower, you probably will feel, and I want you to try try this sometimes. Uh, after you and your significant other have stepped out of the shower and they haven't put any lotion on or any perfume or nothing that smells good, and see how you feel. See if there's been a shift in the way that you feel about them. Um, if there's been more attraction or less attraction to them based on just their smell. Um, because there is that there is that chemical interaction there. Same thing with sweaty bodies. So sweaty bodies, um, people, for, for certain individuals, um, for their mates or significant others, people will enjoy the the smell of the sweat. Now, I'm not talking about once you've like been at the gym all day and then you smell like terrible because you've been working out and you got dirt mixed with the sweat, but just like a nice little glowing sweat. Um, people are generally attracted, unbeknownst to them, to that, and that's just the release of those pheromones. And that is part of what that chemistry that we're always talking about between two individuals. So hormones have a much wider range of effects on the target cells, unlike neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters either cause an action potential or they don't. They either send the signal or the message or they don't. So hormones can have effects such as increase the uptake of a particular substance, insulin, for instance. Um, once that hormone binds to the target cell, it uh, clouds the cell to increase the amount of insulin that comes into it. It can alter the cell structure in some way. Um, it can influence the cell's metabolism, whether it's telling it to metabolize faster or slower, and you have thyroid hormones that will do that. Glucagon, insulin will do that, growth hormones. So there are a variety of different cells um, that can help to, or different hormones that can help to influence the cell's metabolism. So let's do some more actions of hormones here. Um, peptide hormones are peptides, which means they're proteins, um, and they can be modified amino acids, and they can be proteins that have a sugar attached to them, and we call those glycoproteins. So growth hormone is a protein based, um, growth hormone is a protein produced and it's secreted by a special endocrine gland called the pituitary gland. And to be specific, the front part or the anterior portion of that pituitary gland. The steroid hormones are derived basically from cholesterol. So cholesterol, even though it gets a bad rap out there in the media, it gets a bad rap in um, in a lot of ways. So you want to lower your cholesterol. Remember we talked about those HDLs and those LDLs, the good cholesterol and the bad cholesterol. But we need cholesterol because it is the base hormone to make our sex hormones. So that would be testosterone and estrogen. Um, so steroid hormones are all derived from cholesterol and they all have that same complex four carbon rings. The only thing that changes between testosterone and estrogen are the different functional groups that are attached to those rings. 
Now, a majority of your hormones are going to be peptide hormones. Those are those protein-based, amino-based, glycoprotein-type hormones. So their actions are going to vary depending on the target cell. Once again, unlike neurotransmitters, where neurotransmitters are um, just the neurotransmitter itself, well, I should say like, like neurotransmitters, um, the neurotransmitters are just themselves, and then how that cell behaves um, responding to that neurotransmitters up to the cell, very much the same way with these hormones. So the actions that hormones are going to depend on, they're just the message. And what those target cells do with that message is dependent on them. So when a hormone like epinephrine binds to a receptor on a muscle cell, it's going to tell that muscle cell to break down the sugar reserves in it, we call glycogen, and use that broken down glycogen, now glucose, to make energy, which is needed for those muscle contractions. So this occurs in steps. The first step is when we have cyclic adenosine monophosphate, monophosphate or CAMP, is going to be made. That's then going to activate the protein kinase in the cell, which activates another enzyme. And so we have what we call this enzymatic cascade that happens to allow for all of these things to take place within the cell in order to ultimately get glycogen to break down glucose so that we can have ATP made. Peptide hormones are almost never going to enter into the target cell. So they're going to do this whole enzymatic cascade. They're going to start it. Or if you think about dominoes being set up and you're going to kind of like notice that the first domino that starts this whole business never touches the last domino. But there are a series of events that have happened because the first domino touched the second domino and so forth. That's kind of how peptide hormones work. So they're going to bind to the receptors on the outside of that cell, and they're going to charge, cause all of these changes to happen on the inside of the cell. And we start with what's called the first messenger, which is a hormone, and then cyclic AMP um, sets about the internal metabolic machinery, which is your second messenger. So here is a beautiful picture that is illustrating exactly what we are talking about. So let's get a little closer. All right. Peptide hormone is released out of the blood vessel. It binds to the receptor on the plasma membrane of the target cell. And because it is bound to that receptor, it's going to, so this is our first messenger, the hormone, it's going to lead to the activation of cyclic AMP. So ATP is turned to cyclic AMP, and then that is the second messenger. Then the cyclic AMP continues this enzymatic cascade where the molecules of glycogen that are stored in the muscle cell are broken down to glucose, which some of these can actually um, go into the blood, or if this is happening within a muscle cell, then it can actually be used internally or locally um, to make more energy or ATP. So actions of steroid hormones. So now we've talked about how peptide hormones work. And remember, a majority of your hormones are peptide hormones. And peptide hormones do not actually directly enter the cell themselves. They're actually going to cause a cascade of events to happen in the cell without by just binding on the target cell. Steroid hormones um, are only the in the adrenal cortex of the, of the uh, adrenal glands, um, the ovaries, and the testes are going to be those endocrine structures that produce Steroid hormones. Um, thyroid hormones belong to a class of molecules called amines, and they act like steroid hormones, but they're not in the same class as steroid hormones, if you will. So steroid hormones, unlike those peptide hormones, do not bind to plasma membrane receptors. Instead, they're going to actually cross the membrane, and they're able to do that because they're hydrophobic, um, which means that um, they don't necessarily like to be around the water, so they're going to be able to cross the membrane very easily. And once they get inside, they're going to bind receptors on the nucleus or to receptors in the cytoplasm. So big difference between peptide hormones and steroid hormones is their very first part of acting is that the peptide hormones bind to the outside of the cell. Steroid hormones are going to go into the cell and bind to either the nucleus or other receptors on the, the, in the cytoplasm. So when steroid hormones bind to the nucleus, um, the, the hormone receptor there, it can actually change or alter the DNA and it can turn off, turn on certain genes. So messenger RNA um, moves ribosomes and protein synthesis will follow. So what this is really saying in, in a real fancy way is that when those hormones go across the um, plasma membrane of the cell and they bind to the nucleus, they can tell that DNA, hey, there are certain 
new genes that should be turned on and there are certain types of proteins that you should be making. So case in point, um, if you notice that um, babies, male and female babies, human babies, they, they all pretty much look the same when they're they're little, right? Like, and I'm not just talking about their sex organs, but if you just look at their little tiny face and their little tiny hands, you don't have a baby that's born with like a little tiny mustache or like extra pectoral muscles or anything, or um, a little baby that's born. Sometimes babies will have like what looks like breast tissue, and that's just because they have all this extra estrogen from the mom because they've been hanging out in mom's uterus for like nine months. But um, they don't have, like, they're not, baby boys are not born with a face full of facial hair and really ripped muscles, even though we know that males typically have more muscular mass than females do. They're just genetically designed that way. Um, so, and not that females can't be muscular because you can't be. Um, so anyway, we know that little babies aren't born that way. So what happens is that as they go through puberty, like my 14-year-old is going through the big change, if you will, and he now is growing hair in places that he didn't have hair before. So like in his armpits, he's growing a little bit of peach fuzz on his face. What's happening here is that his body, and it takes a little bit longer time for this process to happen, for this hormonal um, steroid action to happen, it takes more time to build these new proteins. So if what's happened is that testosterone has gone across the cells of some of the, uh, gone across the membrane of some of the cells that are in his armpit and on his face, and that testosterone is binding to the DNA, and it's saying, hey, now it's time to turn on the protein, the gene, to make the proteins for hair in the armpits and in the face. So now we have these new things that are happening to his body where he's growing facial hair, he's growing more armpit hair. For people that are um, individuals that are um, transitioning from male to female, those hormones that are, are taken as a part of that transition transition act in the exact same way. So if you're transitioning from male to female, then you would take more estrogen hormones, and those estrogen hormones are going to bind to the DNA, and it's going to activate particular types of genes to make certain type of proteins, and it's going to deactivate, so since we're talking facial hair, it's going to deactivate those genes that are responsible for making the proteins of facial hair um, on the face, obviously, and then vice versa is true for testosterone, uh, for individuals transitioning from female to male. So the action for steroid hormones typically lasts longer than for peptide hormones. So here is a pretty picture of all that stuff happening. So here we have our steroid hormone, and because it's hydrophobic, it can go ahead and cross right through that plasma membrane. Once it does that, it's going to bind to receptors inside the nucleus. So it's going to even make its way through those nuclear pores and then it binds to those receptors in the nucleus. As it does that, because the DNA is the taskmaster, if you will, of the cell, um, once it does that, it says, hey, we need to turn on XY gene. When I say XY, I just mean like whatever. We need to turn on so-and-so gene, so we need to turn off so-and-so genes. So it's then going to activate this gene and you'll have this messenger RNA, which the whole job of messenger RNA in any scenario is to take the message of the DNA and make sure that the appropriate proteins get made. So then the messenger RNA goes out into the cytoplasm and it makes sure that the appropriate proteins are made to carry out the wishes of the DNA. So now that we've talked, talked about hormonal actions and how they do their thing, what their job is. Let's talk about some um, prominent endocrine structures or glands. So the first one we're going to talk about the hypothalamus, So, or actually the pituitary gland. Um, the hypothalamus is that link between the nervous system and the endocrine system. If you remember, the hypothalamus was like a little hangy ball thingy that was happening in the brain that was right there underneath the thalamus in kind of like the midbrain. So Hypothalamus regulates the internal environment um, via the automatic nervous system. So things like body temperature are controlled by your hypothalamus. Um, water salt balance is also controlled by the hypothalamus. It also controls the secretions by that master. We call this the master endocrine gland because, as you'll see, there are so many different aspects. Other different endocrine organs are affected by the secretions that come from this master endocrine gland called the pituitary gland. So the pituitary gland is directly connected to a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. And that's why we say the hypothalamus is that link between the nervous and the endocrine system. 
So the pituitary gland is connected to the hypothalamus via a little stalk that we call the infundibulum. And then once we get down to that pituitary gland, we have a front portion to it and a back portion to it. The back portion we call the posterior pituitary and the front portion we call the anterior. Now it's important to know this that we have both a back and a front portion because they're going to set release or secrete various different hormones. And here's a picture of what we're talking about. So there is your hypothalamus and then we have um, the types of hormones that are released from the posterior pituitary gland and then you have your anterior pituitary gland and notice that your posterior endocrine gland uh, is directly connected to like there's direct um, synapses or um, nerve connections to the hypothalamus or the part of the brain as well. So um, neurosecretory cells produce antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin at the hypothalamus. Um, these hormones will move down the axon terminal, so that's that whole um, direct connection there. And when appropriate, antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin are released from the axon terminals and into the bloodstream. So then we have our anterior pituitary gland. So um, conditions of the um, posterior pituitary gland that can lead to adverse conditions, diabetes insipidus, is the inability to produce this really needed hormone called antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone um, means that uh, if you don't produce enough antidiuretic hormone, then you're going to have large amounts of urine that are released. Now, you might think, oh, that's not a big deal if you're going to pee a lot. But it actually is because you're losing more fluid than you need to. Antidiuretic hormone's job is, because diuretics make you go urine, antidiuretic hormone's job is to make sure that um, blood volume, in part, is maintained because it keeps some volume of fluid in your body so that your blood pressure can stay where it needs to be because your blood volume is where it needs to be. So, and if you have are releasing too much urine, then you are at risk of severe dehydration and losing really important ions like calcium, potassium, um, sodium ions, which are needed for all sorts of things in your body that we've talked about this session already. And we can correct this by administering um, antidiuretic hormone. Oxytocin is a hormone of release by the posterior pituitary gland as well. Um, it causes uterine contractions during childbirth, um, and it also is responsible for that milk let down during breastfeeding. Um, because you have that milk let down during breastfeeding, and, and breastfeeding moms know this, that after you've had a baby, if you nurse your baby, you get these really powerful cramps that happen. And that is because your uterus is contracting more than for mothers who are are not breastfeeding. So because you're still having more of that oxytocin that's releasing. That's one of the reasons why they say, oh, breastfeeding will help you get down to your pre-baby weight faster. And that's because your uterus that's now ballooned to about the size of a small melon is now going back to the size of a grapefruit is what it should be at a much faster rate because of the forceful contractions that are happening as a result of its oxytocin. Um, oxytocin also is kind of what we consider a love hormone. So after you've had a child, those feelings of attachment and um, like, oh, they're just so cute and perfect, even though they actually look like little tiny bald aliens or little furry aliens, um, they're just absolutely perfect to you because this is a, a hormone that um, gives connection between human beings. We call it kind of the love hormone that's there. As your baby suckles from the breast, those nerve signals reach the hypothalamus, and it causes the body to produce more oxytocin, so we get those uterine cramps. And then in addition to that, what the baby is excited about, it causes the woman's breast milk to be released. So now some hormones on the front side of the pituitary gland, the anterior pituitary gland, we have thyroid-stimulating hormone, which is going to stimulate another endocrine organ. Remember I called the pituitary gland the master endocrine gland? This is why. So it's going to stimulate the thyroid to make thyroid hormones. Adenopornotropic hormones, or ACTH, stimulates the adrenal cortex to produce cortisol. Adrenal cortex would be um, the outside portion of the adrenal glands, which sit on top of the kidneys. So that's yet another endocrine gland. Gonadotrophic hormones, um, follicle-stimulating hormone, FSH, luteinizing hormone, LH, stimulate the gonads. So that would be testes if you got them ovaries if you have them, to produce gametes and sex hormones. So as I said before, we call the pituitary gland the master endocrine gland because its secretions can affect other endocrine glands. 
Prolactin produced only after childbirth, and that causes the mammary glands to produce milk. Melanocyte stimulating hormone causes skin color changes in other animals, but it doesn't really do the same thing in humans. It has a, we're not quite sure exactly what it does in humans, but it doesn't cause skin color changes in in humans. Um, it could have, it has, it does have a role in skin color, but just in affecting how much melanin is produced by those melanocytes. Growth hormone is yet another hormone found in the front part of your pituitary gland. Um, it helps to promote skeletal and muscular growth. Um, the way that it does this is that it increases how much protein synthesis happens for those cells, and that's what, if, in effect, gives it that growth. So it simulates the, the production of an insulin-like growth factor by the liver that also increases growth and development. And because it's an insulin-like growth factor, that just means that it's able to help those local cells to take up glucose, which will give the cell more energy to have more protein synthesis take place. So the effects of growth hormone. So quantities of growth hormone are greatest during childhood and adolescence, which you've noticed when you go from being a little teeny tiny two-foot infant um, to becoming a four foot or five foot um, child in adolescence and then depending on your genes and depending on your nutrition and depending on um, your growth hormone, then you have, you know, you're the six foot whatever adult. Most people stop growing, um, for women I should say, most women stop growing about six months, six to nine months after their first menstrual cycle. Um, they usually stop growing, sometimes they, within a year of their first period. For males, on the other hand, they have a little bit longer growth period that um, males can grow until they're about 25 years old. They have a little bit longer window of growing. I know for my husband and my brother both, they actually had like growth spurts happen in college. So I remember going away um, to college, because my brother's three years younger than me, and when I went away, we were the same height. I came back for Christmas, he was like an inch and a half taller than me. I go away for the school year again, I come back again, he's another inch taller than me. And then when um, I finished college and he had moved away, I would see him for Christmas or family meetings and he would still grow some more. So um, men typically grow, have a little longer growing season than women do. Pituitary dwarfism is when too little growth hormone is produced in children. Um, perfect proportions of their limbs, but they're just small. Giantism is the opposite of that. There's too much growth hormone in children, so they're a very large stature, and a lot of times because of that really excessive growth that happened, there can be other problems. Agrobegly is too much growth hormone in adults. So at this point, the long bone growth is no longer possible, so only the hands and the feet and the face become overly large. And here is how growth hormone can influence height. And then here is that agromegaly that we talked about where we have um, the growth that's happening in the hands and the face and the feet as adults because the long bones, bones there's no more um, growth plate, no more, well, there's a growth line there, but there's no more growth cartilage in those long bones, so there's no more space for those to grow longer. So moving down with the pituitary gland, we will go down to the thyroid gland that is found in your throat area. Um, thyroid gland regulates the metabolic rate of the body, and it also has a role in calcium homeostasis that we talked about way back in the thyroid or in the skeletal chapter. Um, your thyroid hormone also requires a small amount of iodine. If it's not enough iodine is not there, the thyroid cannot make or produce its thyroid hormones. So you have these levels, um, low levels of thyroid hormones will increase the secretion of thyroid stimulating hormone, which comes from your pituitary gland. And because you have all of this um, thyroid stimulating hormone, but you're not making enough of the thyroid hormone itself, then you can have what are called goiters. So an endemic goiter is just an enlarged thyroid gland from increased levels of thyroid stimulating hormone, not having enough iodine to make that thyroid hormone. And um, you could also have ophthalmic goiters, which is just a larger eye. And then there's congenial goiter, goiters um, or congenial um, hypothyroidism that we see in infants where they'll need to be administered these thyroid hormones. So thyroid hormones increase metabolic rate, but do not have a target organ which means that they're going to stimulate all the cells of the body, 
to metabolize things at a faster rate. So here we have that endemic goiter um, right here and a thyroid, um, congenial hypothyroidism, and then we have the um, exophthalmic uh, thyroid with the enlarged eye. So with congenial hypothyroidism, that's just they have an underdeveloped thyroid at birth because, hey, their brand's speaking new. Um, and usually we, we can do things to um, address that. So there's an under secretion of the thyroid hormone because their thyroid gland is just kind of underdeveloped at birth. So what we do is that we give the thyroid hormone their thyrone hormone therapy right away within the first two months of life. If that doesn't happen, then we can have intellectual disabilities result. But for most babies that are born, especially um, babies that are born in more developed countries or countries that are receiving adequate aid, um, we just can very easily just give them this thyroid hormone and a lot of times their, their thyroid gland will start to mature and produce these hormones themselves. Myotexema is a hypothyroidism in adults. Some of the symptoms of that are lethargy, weight gain, loss of hair, slower pose, lower body temperature. Um, reason for these things is because remember we talked about on this slide that the job of the thyroid hormones is to increase metabolic rate um, and they help to stimulate all cells of the body to metabolize at a faster rate. If you're not making enough thyroid hormones, then you're not going to have metabolism take place as it normally would. And in much the same way as we treat congenital hypothyroidism, um, we can treat adult hypothyroidism with the administration of thyroid hormones and that helps to restore their normal function. So on the flip side of that thyroid gland, we have what's called the parathyroid gland, and that parathyroid gland is going to release parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. Parathyroid and calcitonin, their whole job is to maintain calcium levels. So calcitonin is secreted by the thyroid gland when blood calcium levels are too high. So what we want that calcitonin to do is that it will take up that excess calcium and it will deposit it into the bones. So, and it reduces the activity of those bone cells called osteoclasts that actually break it down. When blood calcium levels are back to normal, then the parathyroid hormone stops releasing that calcitonin. So calcitonin release when blood calcium levels are too high because we want to put some more of that calcium into the bone and deposit it there. Calcium ions, as we've already discussed all throughout this session, they have a role in nerve conduction. They have a role in muscle contraction. They have a role in blood clotting. There's a lot of stuff that calcium ions do. So we want to make sure that we regulate that ion. Parathyroid hormone, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. So it's going to be released in response to low blood calcium levels. So it's going to promote the activity of those osteoclasts in your skeletal system so that it can free, if you will, that stored calcium that's in there in order to increase the blood calcium levels. Parathyroid hormone also is going to activate calcederol or vitamin D, which promotes more calcium reabsorption by the kidneys, and it's going to stimulate your body to absorb more calcium from the food. All of this is done to make sure that the blood calcium levels come back to that normal range, and once it does, the parathyroid hormone stops releasing um, its hormone. All right, so moving down from the throat um, in the thyroid hormone, we are now going to go down to your abdominal region, and we're going to look on top of your kidneys. Remember, your kidneys are paired organs. You have one on the left side and the right side, at least most folks do, unless you've donated one to someone or you've had kidney failure. Um, you have two of them, and on top of them sit like two little hats. You have your adrenal glands. Your adrenal medulla um, is the inside portion of your adrenal gland, and then you have your adrenal cortex, which is the outside portion of it. For your adrenal medulla, the inner portion of it, the hypothalamus, that little bottom part of your brain that's connected to your pituitary gland, sends signals through the preganglionic sympathetic nerve fibers to the inside of that adre um, uh, adrenal gland, and it stimulates the secretion of different hormones. Um, epinephrine, or adrenaline and norepinephrine, called noradrenaline, they're going to bring about changes during a flight or fight response. So that's why it's important that we have a direct nerve connection, if you will, between the hypothalamus and the adrenal medulla of your adrenal glands. Because we want to very quickly, if we see a bear, need to run away from a bear, or if we're brave enough to fight this bear, we want to make sure that we have this epinephrine that is released in order for this whole thing to take place. So um, 
the effects of epinephrine and norepinephrine are not nearly as long lasting as the effects of like estrogen and testosterone or any of those other steroid hormones. They're going to be very short term responses to, to stress. So here we have the adrenal cortex on the outside and the adrenal medulla is right there on the inside. Now, as far as the outside of the adrenal gland is concerned, um, the adrenal cortex is what we call that. It has three different regions of it, the zona glomerulus, the zona fasciolata, and the zona rect recticularis. Um, the adrenal cortex governs sex, sugar, salt. First one we're going to talk about here are the sugar portion of that. So sex, sugar, sh salt, think about that for the adrenal cortex. So hormones produced provide a much long-term response to stress as opposed to like the medulla give you a very short-term response. These hormones are going to give you a much longer-term response to whatever stressful situation that was. Um, they also secrete small amounts of male and female sex hormones in both sexes. Um, and the major types of hormones that are produced by this adrenal cortex are going to be the glucocorticoids, that's the sugar, mineral corticoids, that's the salt, and then we already talked about small amounts of sex hormones, that's the sex, um, for uh, the adrenal cortex. So let's talk about the sugar first. So glucocorticoids are secretions controlled by the ACTH that comes from the pituitary gland, and its whole job is to regulate carbohydrate, protein, and fat metabolism, which means its ability to break these things down. So this hormone is produced in the zona fasciolata and the zona reticularis regions. Cortisol is a glucocorticoid that is active in in the stress response and the repair of damaged tissue. So we like to have cortisol released if you have um, an event of stress because it can help with healing that tissue, repairing that tissue wherever it may be in the body, and it can also um, um, just get the body to be back in its normal working order. Now cortisol is not a good thing to have all the time. So if you are chronically stressing your body and you have this amount of cortisol that is released, that is an indication that something is chronically wrong. And that can actually cause, because you're devoting more attention to um, repairing things, that means that your body's not normally in a nice, healthy homeostasis. It's spending energy and resources to constantly repair things. And you can imagine if you had a house that you had to constantly repair, that's going to be draining on you. So people that have these high amounts of cortisol released all the time are going to be very lethargic. They're going to have um, very little energy to do things. So um, cortisol is not always a bad thing. You probably hear about cortisol being referred to as like, oh, cortisol is a stress, you know, stress hormone, stress hormone. It's a good thing when it, it's made when it needs to be made. It's not so much a good thing if you're chronically stressed. And unfortunately, when you live in our more um, developed societies, we find stress on everything. We stress over what I like to call real life first world problems. So like my daughter who is 18, broke her iPhone and she needs a new iPhone. And for her, it's a total need. So that is a stressor for her. Um, for my 10-year-old who's getting a room remodel, it is such a stressor for her because she, she needs to have this room remodel done and things have to be just right. So that's a stress over a first world problem. Stressing over, mm, I don't know, not eating, being shot at, being mauled by an animal, those are stressors that our ancestors had to deal with. And there are stressors that a lot of people in various different parts of the world have to deal with. Um, so for them to have low amounts of cortisol, that's not um, good either, but we can understand that more. That makes a, more of a physiological sense to it. And there are all sorts of things that you can do to reduce your cortisol levels um, that don't include medication. Working out helps to do that, so having a good um, exercise regimen. Also, eating healthy helps to do that as well. And meditating, believe it or not, it helps to reduce those stress levels, and it helps you to have to take a broader perspective of the world around you and what is actually should or should not be causing you stress. Glucocorticoids raise blood glucose levels in two ways. First way is they actually promote the muscles, um, the breakdown of muscles, proteins to amino acids, where they're then taken up by the liver. The liver converts those amino acids to glucose. And the second way, they promote metabolism of fatty acids rather than carbohydrate, which can actually spare that glucose so we can use it for a time that we need it. Cortisone and also glucocorticoids can relieve swelling and pain from inflammation in much the same way that we talked about chronic stress 
um, not being a good thing. Chronic widespread inflammation is also not a good thing and can degrade um, tissues. Even though an inflammatory response is saying, hey, there's something wrong, deal with it here. If you're always having an inflammatory response all over your body, it's saying there's something wrong all over. And we can change that most readily with a change in diet and activity. Um, my cortisone and other glucocorticoids can release swelling and pain for inflammation. However, by suppressing pain and immunity, they can also make a person susceptible to injury and infection. So once again, if you're always having these levels of low levels, chronic inflammation, you're always going to be making this cortisol, cortisone and other glucocorticoids. Um, and what they do by trying to, you know, put out those fires, it actually means your body is going to be more susceptible or likely for injury and infection to take place. So for my husband who has degenerative disc disease, one of the first things that we did was that we wanted to reduce all of the inflammation, all the chronic inflammation, low-grade chronic inflammation that was happening in his body, and we did that with a change in diet. So he doesn't eat anything that could cause him to be inflamed. So no genetically modified organisms, um, no white rice, no sugar. Um, no white flour, not, none of those things that we know for sure um, that will cause him to have an inflammatory response. So mineral corticoids, they're going to regulate ion balance within the body. And so this is that salt portion of it. These are produced by the zona glomerularis of the cortex. Aldosterone is the most important of these mineral corticoids. So what aldosterone does is that it um, targets the kidney specifically, and it promotes the absorption of sodium and excess potassium ions. So you've probably heard the adage, and if you have not heard the adage, I'm going to tell you now, water follows salt, right? So if we are, are absorbing more of these sodium ions, we're going to also absorb more fluid. We're going to absorb more water, and that helps to maintain um, the blood volume level and also helps to maintain your blood pressure. So we also have the hormone um, renin. Renin is secreted by the kidneys. So remember these, this uh, adrenal cortex, the adrenal glands, they sit right there on top of the kidneys. So there should be no big surprise that there's going to be a connection with the kidneys. Um, renin is secreted by the kidneys when blood sodium levels and blood pressure is low. And when that is when renin is released, the enzyme converts the plasma protein angiotensin to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2, um, angiotensin is changed to angiotensin 2 by um, enzymes from the lungs, and then angiotensin 2 actually is what stimulates the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. So it's kind of like a chain effect. So the kidneys will recognize when the blood sodium blood salt levels, sodium levels, are a little bit low. So it releases an enzyme that is going to turn one plasma protein into another, and then that plasma protein is going to stimulate the release of aldosterone to allow the body to absorb more sodium ions, thereby also resorb, absorbing more or promoting the absorption of more fluid, which will now raise the low blood pressure and low blood volume. And once again, I so apologize for how these slides look. I don't know why it does this sometimes. So renin angiotensin aldosterone system raises blood pressure in two ways. Um, the first way we talked about it being that it would cause the body to retain more water and that goes into the blood and that retention of water increases blood volume which increases blood pressure. So that's the first way we already talked about in the previous slide. And the second way is that angiotensin 2 can constrict the arterioles which makes their pathway a little smaller. Um, so since their pathway is smaller, the blood pressure is going to increase because the, they're not as dilated, they're more constricted. So now we're going to actually be moving up from the, well, yeah, moving slightly up from the adrenal glands and the kidneys up to the heart. And we have the atrial natriuretic hormone, or ANH, um, released by stretched cardiac cells after an increase in blood volume. It's going to actually inhibit the secretion of, of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. So if the blood pressure is high or it's um, where it needs to be, then ANH is going to be reduced released, and that's going to prevent the adrenal cortex from releasing aldosterone. Um, it can cause natriuresis, which is an excre ex the excretion of sodium ions. So when sodium ions are excreted, so is water because water follows what? Salt. Therefore, the blood pressure lowers back down to normal. 
So in addition to the glucocorticoids, the sugar part, cortisol, we talked about that, um, and, and then long-term respond to stress, um, the zona facularia and the zona reticularis are also going to re recreate also going to secrete small amounts of sex hormones called um, gonadoglucocorticoids, not gluco, gonadocorticoids. Um, these are androgens, the male sex hormones, and the female sex hormone, estrogen. So the primary androgen is DHEA, which is the precursor for testosterone, the male sex hormone. Um, although we have the adrenal glands, going back down to adrenal glands, produce small amounts of estradiol, which is a form of estrogen. Most estrogen is going to be produced by the ovaries. And the adrenal estradiol plays a role in regulating the growth, the skeleton and pituitary in puberty, and also in maintaining bone mass as um, women age and get older. So some malfunctions of the adrenal cortex. Um, Addison's disease is an under-secretion of glucocorticoids. Um, the presence of excessive but ineffective ACTH is going to cause for the skin to have more of this browning, bronzing effect just to build up all that melanin. Without those glucocorticoids, glucose cannot be replenished in a stressful situation. And even a mild infection can be quite catastrophic because the body's not making or not utilizing glucose in a, an efficient enough way to help deal with that infection. Um, in some cases, hyposecretion of aldosterone can cause a loss of sodium and water, which would lower blood pressure and have severe dehydration that can result. Probably the most famous person that you know that had Addison's disease was JFK. Um, you'll always notice that in any of the things that you saw, he always had this beautiful glowing bronze tan. And like he always had like a bronzing happening to him. Um, like he was always tan no matter what, but that was because of the disease where he had, um, he had Addison disease. So we can see kind of like the bronzing of the skin that happens there. Cushing sy syndrome is the opposite of Addison's disease. So Addison's disease is uh, an under-secretion of glucocorticoids. Cushing's disease is an over-secretion of glucocorticoids. So this caused by, it can be caused by tumors on the pituitary gland, which means you're going to have more excessive ACTH secretion, and or the adrenal cortex can be just secreting more of these glucocorticoids itself. And the most common cause of this um, the most common cause is taking glucocorticoids to treat other infections uh, or other conditions. And what happens is um, that is to suppress chronic inflammation. So if you're having chronic inflammation and you might be taking something like uh, prednisone, um, which is meant to kind of address that chronic inflammation or it's a medication to take it, the back side of that is that you're going to have um, too much of these glucocorticoids that are produced. and um, have Cushing syndrome. Some hallmarks of Cushing syndrome are going to be um, a lot of weight gain. So you have excessive weight gain that happens from that. Um, I'm not sure if he actually had it or not, but I think it was believed that at one point in time Val Kimmler may have had Cushing syndrome. And for people that are on prednisone or in any of these type of um, steroids that will produce glucocorticoids or uh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, glucocorticoids production in the body, they will have uh, this weight gain and these Cushing syndrome um, features. All right, now sliding down from the adrenal glands and the kidneys to the pancreas, which is going to be housed between the bottom part, the top part of the um, duodenum of the large intestine and anchored to the bottom portion of the stomach. Pancreas is both endocrine and exocrine. Um, exocrine tissues have those digestive enzymes we've talked about. The endocrine tissues that are going to be um, released by the pancreatic islets or the islets of Langerhaus, um, they're going to contain a variety of cell size. Cell types. A cell types secrete glucagon, B cell types secrete insulin, and D cells secrete som somatostatin. And they are going to also help in, in regulating of the digestive process. But what we are most concerned with are insulin and glucagon. Um, insulin, unlike most other endocrine organs, the pancreas is not under pituitary control. So even though the pituitary gland is a master endocrine gland, this kind of has its own little thing. Um, it responds directly to changes in blood glucose level. When blood glucose levels are high after eating, the pancreas gland will 
releases insulin. And what insulin does is that it triggers the target cells to uptake glucose by them, specifically your liver cells and muscle cells, as well as your fat cells. And by this insulin binding to the receptors on these target cells, it allows for glucose to go into the cells to be used by them for energy. And in that way, insulin lowers blood sugar levels. The complete opposite of that is glucagon. Glucagon is going to be secreted when blood sugar levels are low. So this is in between meals, when you're getting hungry or starting to get hungry. So that's going to stimulate your liver to actually break down glycogen to turn it into glucose so that we can make sure that your blood sugar levels stay in about a normal range, whether you're pre-meal or post-meal. Um, it's going to also promote the use of fat and protein um, in preference to glucose for an energy source so we can save some of that glucose so it stays in the bloodstream and that can be balanced. Adipose cells break down fat to glycerol and fatty acids, and the liver takes these up, um, those fatty acids in particular, does a little chemistry with them and converts them into glucose. So in this way, the way that glucagon works is that it helps to raise blood sugar levels. So you're probably very familiar with this, type 1 and type 2 diabetes or of diabetes mellitus. Um, that is excess glucose in the blood. So as blood glucose levels rise, glucose along with water is excreted in the urine. So that's why diabetics usually urinate more frequently and are kind of always thirsty. Um, other symptoms of diabetes are fatigue, constant hunger, um, and you can even see weight loss, specifically for type 1 diabetes. The high blood glucose levels can also um, cause an increase in blood pressure due to osmosis, and it can damage the capillaries of the kidneys and the capillaries of the eyes um, because you have this very viscous blood, so it's, it's exerting a lot of pressure on the blood vessels, and it can actually cause them to burst or to stroke or to hemorrhage. So the two different types of diabetes mellitus, um, type 1 and type 2. Type 1, we typically called it before um, child or adolescent diabetes. So folks that have type 1 diabetes are usually diagnosed in childhood or in adolescence, but there are some cases where there are adults that um, are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, and we call this one the insulin-dependent diabetes on there, that your body's just not making enough insulin at all. It's not that you have an issue with diet or exercise or anything. Um, it's just that your body's not making enough insulin. I have an aunt who was diagnosed in her 40s with type 1 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is also known as adult onset diabetes or non-insulin dependent. So the cause of this form of diabetes can be very different. Um, they can occur, type 2 diabetes can occur in children and in adults. We're actually seeing more children. We had seen a trend of more children that had type 2 diabetes and that was directly related to diet and um, exercise, but we primarily see this with adults that uh, it's affected by diet and exercise. So type 1 diabetes, as I said before, the pancreas is making up insulin um, caused by exposure to an environmental agent. Sometimes it's like a virus that causes the pancreas not to make enough insulin. Um, or you can have an autoimmune, autoimmune response that destroys the pancreatic uh, islets that actually are the cells that are responsible for making insulin. So the body will actually metabolize fat, which leads to a buildup of these ketones called ketone acidosis. So because of the leftover or the byproduct of metabolizing this fat and having or, or breaking down, I should say metabolizing, breaking down this fat and the byproduct of that are these ketones that have a very low pH and increases the acidity of the blood and it can lead to coma and can lead to death. Um, so chronic ketoacidosis or it's happening kind of all the time, not a very good thing. But if you do paleo diet or if you're doing um, I forgot what the other one was. It's like paleo. Maybe it is paleo. But there's another diet where you're not consuming as many carbs, but you're consuming more proteins and more fats. You are letting your body do ketoacidosis, um, where you're restricting your your, cardi your carbohydrate intake. Your, your body is going through ketoacidosis, but it's not going to through it to the extreme as for people who have type 1 diabetes, where they're not getting any carbs at all. So they have this really, really low pH. So for people that are on like paleo diet, and I forgot the other one, we only have like 26 grams of carbs, um, their ketoacidosis is not so severe unless they're not following the diet the, the correct way. So for people who have type 1 diabetes, they have to inject themselves daily. Um, a lot of diabetics have a little pump that does that for them. So make sure they have little infusions of 
um, insulin throughout the day. Blood sugar levels can kind of swing between being a very blood low blood glucose, so hypoglycemic, and very high hyperglycemic. hyperglycemic. Um, symptoms of both include perspiration, pale skin, shallow breathing, and then there's just like this overall anxiety. If the problem of hypoglycemia is, if hypoglycemia is a problem, the treatment is just ingesting more sugars. If the problem is hyperglycemia, then the, the issue is that we just need to give you some more insulin. So type 2 diabetes are what we used to call adult onset diabetes. Um, most adults um, most adults that are diabetic have type 2. Um, patients are often overweight or obese, um, have adipose tissue, um, produces a substance that impairs insulin and receptor function because of that excess adipose tissue, um, often occurs more often in certain families or even ethnic groups. For instance, 77% more common in African Americans than in non-Hispanic whites. And what we believe is that the reason that may be the case, what we say um, certain more often in certain families, is it can relate to diet um, a lot of times. So a lot of it, there are certain foods that different, different ethnic groups eat different types of food. It's just part of their tradition. Um, and a lot of those foods that are eaten by African Americans, for example, or by Hispanics are, um, or Latinos are going to be very high in carbohydrates. So things like um, rices, um, lots and lots of carbs that are consumed there. And that would give reason for these type 2 diabetes. A lot of times with type 2 diabetes, the and this is considered the insulin resistant. So it means that your body's not that it's not making enough insulin. Your pancreas is totally making enough insulin. The issue, on the other hand, is that your body is resistant to um, that insulin. So um, what we can do to prevent type 2 diabetes is a lot of times it can be controlled directly by diet and exercise. So adhering to a diet, exercising regularly can help to address type 2 diabetes. If that fails, um, then oral drugs can help. Millions of Americans may have type 2 diabetes without even knowing it. Um, type 2 diabetes can cause stroke. Um, it can cause uh, what we call retinopathy, which would be like the detachment of the retina from the back of the eye. Um, untreated diabetes can cause lose limbs. You can die. You can um, have all sorts of things that happen. So it's important that you have your blood sugar level checked, especially as you get older or if you have a familial history of diabetes. The effects of type 2 diabetes are as serious as the untreated effects of those with type 1. All right, so that is it for the endocrine system. Next time we come back here, um, we will be talking about um, more stuff that's happening in human biology. I hope you enjoyed this. Have an awesome morning, noon, or night.